Last time we wanted a matrix C such that C is close to A transpose B. Remember that uh, A was like a tall, skinny matrix, and so was and B was also a tall, skinny matrix. And they both have n rows. n is huge, I'm imagining. And I don't want to compute A transpose B explicitly because that's expensive. So instead, I want to somehow quickly compute some C such that C is close to A transpose B in some norm. So last time we did Frobenius norm error. And there were two ways, sampling and random projections. And basically, all these norms here were Frobenius norms. And today, we're going to do operator norms. Okay. Um, and I'll, at the end of last lecture, I mentioned kind of without loss of generality, we can assume that A equals B. Because instead, what we can do is spectrally approximate this matrix M. And if you approximate M, if you approximate M transpose M, it implies that you approximated A transpose B. Okay, so from now on, A and B are the same matrix, so this is what we want down here. Okay, and today we're going to show how to get, we're going to get, we're going to achieve this. Actually, we're going to achieve something a little bit stronger than this. So uh, today, we'll deal with uh, what we call subspace embeddings. Okay, so um, let me first give you a definition. <clears throat> okay, so we're given some E, which is a subset of Rn, is a linear subspace. Okay, and <coughs> pi. An m by n matrix pi is an epsilon subspace embedding for E. This is the thing we're defining. If for all vectors x and E, it's the case that pi preserves the norm. So one, so we have the usual JL kind of guarantee. OK? So this is the definition of a subspace embedding. Just think JL on this subspace. Okay. And what does that have to do with that? Well, <clears throat> so for us, E will be the column space of A. OK? So that implies that for all x, so what is a vector in the column space of A? It's something of the form AX, right? So what does it mean that we preserve everything in the column space? It means that for all x in RD, so let's say A is actually n by D, we have that pi AX L2 norm squared minus uh, is at most 1 plus epsilon AX squared, and it's at least uh, 1 minus epsilon AX squared. Right, so maybe let me call this Z. So actually, like Z is AX. Okay, so we're preserving every Z in the subspace. Well, every vector in the subspace is of the form AX. Okay. Um, <coughs> so for us, C is just equal to uh, you know D transpose D, which is equal to pi a transpose pi a. Okay. And what this guarantee is saying is it implies that um, for all x, we have that x transpose uh, that matrix. So x transpose a transpose a minus pi a transpose pi a. x is at most ax l2 norm squared times epsilon. Right, so, so star is implying this condition, which is even stronger than that line, right? Because that line on the right-hand side 
you have the operator norm of a squared. Right? So you're comparing your error to like the worst thing that a could do to a vector. Whereas here, you're getting that it actually preserves x itself. Okay, so uh, this is the subspace embedding guarantee. Questions about definitions? Okay. So first question, uh, naturally, you know, usually just like JL, we want, we want it to be the case that M is much less than N. Right? We're trying to do some kind of dimensionality reduction. Okay. And before I get into how to come up with subspace embeddings, well, actually, okay, first let me convince you that um, there are subspace embeddings with small m. Okay. And then after I do that, I'm going to tell you how you can use subspace embeddings for like, problems you might care about, like least squares regression. Okay? And then we're going to see how to efficiently come up with subspace embeddings. So let me write that down, rest of today. First, what we're going to do is show subspace embedding exists for non-trivial epsilon, kind of if, it, uh, if and only if. M is at least D. So you can't have a subspace embedding with less than D rows. And you can have a zero subspace embedding with D rows. You can have a perfect subspace embedding with D rows. OK? Show how to use subspace embedding for, say, least squares regression. And then, um, and then I'm going to, you know, uh, find subspace embeddings efficiently. And there are going to be two ways, just like last time. Sampling is one way, and then another way is JL. Okay. And then I'm going to wrap up by kind of going back to this. So more efficient ways. To use subspace embeddings. So kind of this bullet is just going to be a proof of concept. I mean, it's going to be a legit way to use subspace embeddings to speed up least squares. But then it turns out there are even kind of better ways or yeah, better ways to use subspace embeddings for least squares. So we'll see that at the end. OK? So the first, the first bullet is, uh, is somewhat simple once you know the right theorem. OK, so <coughs> uh, claim. So any subspace is the column space of some matrix, right? Um, just write a basis for the subspace as columns of a matrix. So from now on, we're going to specify our subspaces by matrices. It's going to be their column spaces. So for any A of rank, let's say D, they're, they're 1 does not exist any epsilon subspace embedding for epsilon less than 1 if m is less than d. Okay, so if you have less than d rows, you can't get a subspace embedding with, with epsilon less than 1. And also, there uh, does exist a 0 subspace embedding with m equal to d. So proof. Okay. Well, <coughs> if m is less than d, then <coughs> the rank of pi is less than d, right? Which implies that um, the dimension of the kernel of pi is at least uh, n minus d plus 1, which implies there exists uh, an x which is not equal to 0 in um, the kernel of pi intersect, intersect e. e is, this, e is the column space of a. Right? So if there's a vector, if there's a non-zero vector in the kernel, well, you're mapping it so it's after you apply pi, its norm is 0, right? You're supposed to preserve the norm up to 1 minus epsilon. So you're not preserving everything in the subspace. 
Okay. This is I'm just saying you're losing rank. Okay. How about two? We'll use. Why does there always exist a zero subspace embedding with m equals d? Okay. Well, I mean the picture to have in mind is just we have a d-dimensional subspace of R n, right? So here's what pi is going to be. It's going to be the product of two matrices. Um, the first matrix to act on the vector will just rotate the subspace. It's a rotation matrix. It'll rotate the subspace so that the subspace becomes the subspace spanned by E1 up to ED. Okay. And then the second matrix that acts on it will just project onto the first D coordinates. Right? So, <clears throat> um, so uh, we'll use pi equal m, let's call it SQ, where <clears throat> Q is a rotation to make uh, rotation such that QE is just the span of E1 up to ED. And S is equal to this matrix. It's the identity here. It's just the projection of the first D coordinates, and the rest is 0. This is a D by D matrix. There well, the whole thing is d by n. Okay. Okay. So great. So we know that there's always this perfect subspace embedding, right? You can't beat zero error, and we know that you can, you know, you can get it if and only if m is at least d. So we know the answer, right? There's d. So you can say, well, you know, what's the rest of the lecture about? What's the point then? Well. You know, for two above right there, how do we find how do we find uh, Q? Right? So there's a theorem. It's like SVD. So this stands for a singular value decomposition. Who's heard of the SVD? Just okay. So some. Um, it says that uh, for any matrix A, for any real matrix, um, there exists U sigma V such that A is equal to U sigma V transpose. OK. <clears throat> uh, for any A, OK, let me call it, let me say, of rank R. Okay, so A is an n by d matrix of rank R. You can write A as u sigma v transpose, where u is an n by r matrix such that u transpose u is the identity. Okay, so in other words, u has orthonormal columns. The columns of u form an orthonormal basis for the column space of A. Also, uh, sigma looks like this. It's an R by R matrix. And the entries here are sigma 1 up to sigma R, where for all i, sigma i is at least 0. These are called the singular values. And V is a D by R matrix with orthonormal columns. So the columns of A form an orthonormal basis for the row space. Uh, sorry, the, the, the columns of V form an orthonormal basis for the row space of A. Okay, So this is just a theorem. You know, it's similar to the spectral theorem. If people remember the spectral theorem, it says that if you, for any real symmetric matrix, so symmetric is the key thing there, you can always diagonalize it using an orthogonal matrix. You can always write A as Q sigma Q transpose, where the diagonal entries of sigma are the eigenvalues. 
right? And, and the columns of Q are the eigenvectors. But in general, even if A is not symmetric, you can always write it like this. OK, this is, um, this is the SVD. So I'll just take this as a given. This is something from linear algebra. OK? And there are algorithms. There exist algorithms to compute uh, this, this decomposition in O of n d squared time, or even up to log factor n d to the omega minus 1, where omega is the exponent of square matrix multiplication. Um, <coughs> This is, this is demo Dimitri and Holtz. OK. So you know, once you have this decomposition, once we have u sigma v transpose, can set pi to just be u transpose, OK? So um, notice that uh, for all x, ax is the same thing as an u sigma v transpose x. These are all L2 norms, which is equal to sigma v transpose x, right? So u doesn't change the norm, right? Just, I mean, the easy way to see that is if you, if you square this thing, you get x transpose v sigma transpose u transpose u sigma v transpose x. But u transpose u is the identity, right? So you can just remove u, and it doesn't change the norm. So um, <coughs> you can set pi. You can just set pi to be u transpose. So this is the same. So this becomes now pi u. Pi u is the identity. And pi has d rows, because u transpose, well, actually, pi has r rows, where r is the rank of a. I'm just assuming that a has full column rank. OK, questions? You look like you have a question. No? Oh, OK, thinking, pondering, OK. Um, Good. So in fact, there is an algorithm to actually compute a perfect subspace embedding. It has d rows, or rank of, rank of a rows, and it has zero error. The problem is the running time. It takes nd squared time, or nd to omega minus 1. Okay? And you know, in this class, we like to speed, speed things up. So um, we want to come up with fast subspace embeddings so that we want to quickly find a subspace embedding so that we can use it in applications and get fast algorithms. Um, <clears throat> OK, so before I tell you how to actually find subspace embeddings quickly, uh, let me say one application of subspace embeddings. So. Uh, least squares regression. OK, so here we're given, we're given a matrix A, which is n by d. Think of n as big. And we're given a B, which is an Rn. And what we want is we want x least squares, which is the argmin over x in Rd of uh, Ax minus b L2 norm squared. Okay. Why do we want this? Um, <coughs> so I'll, I'll spend a little time on the background, but this is now getting into stats, which I'm not going to focus on, but some, some background. Um, there exists a hidden x star uh, in R, R, D, 
and we want to find it. OK. And <coughs> we're actually, yeah, there's, there exists a hidden x star in RD, and we want to find it. Um, or more generally, let's say that. Um, Let me write it like this, actually. Let's say there exists a hidden kind of f star, okay, which maps rd to r. Want to find it, okay? And we know that f star comes from some family of functions. We want to know which function in the family is the one that is the truth. So. <laughs> And there exists um, d plus 1 variables let me call these uh, kind of y1 up to yd as well as a variable z. And what we're assuming is we're assuming there's some functional relationship between y and z. We're assuming that z is actually f of y. Okay? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to get many different y vectors, okay? So we get, we do some experiments, okay? We collect some data from somewhere, and we get y1, y2, yn, as well as you know z1, zn. Okay, these are all these are all numbers. This is a vector. This is this is an RD. So this is actually this d-dimensional vector, and then we get what should be f of that vector to get z1. And then we get another d-dimensional vector, and we get kind of f of that vector. OK? But there's noise. There's noise in our, in our data collection. There's noise. So zr is actually kind of f star. We're assuming that zr is actually f star of yr plus noise, random noise. Okay, and if we assume that f star of y is actually equal to uh, a dot product kind of x star of, of y, then what XLS is doing is it's returning for us the maximum likelihood estimator of f star. It's giving us the, be it's giving us the maximum likelihood estimator for x star over here. OK, so kind of in general, so this is a, this is a, a linear regression problem. So that's why you know, we want to solve this thing here. OK? So now let me just focus on solving, um, let me focus on solving this. Any questions? OK, so back to, uh, Oh wait, so maybe I should just write this. So if we assume that this is true, then XLS is the maximum likelihood estimator. For, um, for X star, if we assume, let me call this noise you know, alpha R. If we assume that alpha R's are independent Gaussians, So this is probably something you would see in like stat 110 maybe, uh, or some intro stats class. So back to back to uh, computing XLS. Well, if you look at that expression up there, <coughs> what kinds of vectors? All you can choose is x, right? So what kinds of vectors can you get as ax? You can get anything in the column space of A, right? So how should you choose x to minimize that L2 norm? 
Well, part of B lives in the uh, part of B lives in the column space of A, and part of B lives in the orthogonal complement. So you should choose X to kill the part that, that lives in the subspace. Right? So choose so XLS is such that AXLS is the projection onto the column space of A of, uh, of B. Which is equal to UU transpose B, where U is that same U from the SVD. Yeah? Oh, there's no power here. I'm just saying, so you mean here? X star. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. So if you assume if you assume that the noise is Gaussian, then yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So if you assume the noise is Gaussian and that your function is actually a linear function, then that's what you should do to recover the function. By the way, there are, there is a very there's some other nice work. Um, on using subspace embeddings for this more general regression where it's non nonlinear regression um, by okay so uh, why wait hold on uh, y p w so p is Polanchi w is Wainwright y is maybe Yang I, I, I forgot who, what y stands for um, but that was this I think this summer maybe or earlier this spring. Um, but yeah, so subspace embeddings get used in lots of different places. Maybe you'll see some on the homework. You'll see some in class. You'll see regression now, and you'll see PCA uh, on Thursday. Um, but yeah, so okay, let's let's get back to to this. So how would you compute the least squares, x least squares? Well, you want this, right? So you can set xls to be uh, v sigma inverse u transpose b, once you have the SVD. I'll leave it to you as an exercise. This also equals um, a transpose a inverse a transpose b. Maybe this is the thing you're used to seeing. This is assuming that a has full column rank. So a, a transpose a is actually invertible. If a transpose a is not invertible, then what you do is compute the pseudo inverse, which basically amounts to doing this. Okay. So this makes sense. This makes sense even when A doesn't have full column rank. So you know you can compute the SVD in, in time n times d squared. You can verify this equality just by writing down A in terms of its SVD. Okay. So you can you can uh, compute the SVD in in the time that I said you know like n d squared, and then you'll solve least squares. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Or you could compute A transpose A and then invert it. Well, inverting it takes like D, it's only a D by D matrix, A transpose A. So inverting it is D cubed, let's say. Computing A transpose A is actually the expensive part. Just using for loops, computing A transpose A takes ND squared time. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so claim. If uh, dx squared is equal to 1 plus or minus epsilon a prime x squared for all x. What's a prime? Where a prime is the matrix. You put an a, you put a here, and then you put b there. Then. Um, if x tilde ls is equal to the argmin over, uh, let's call it, x prime is x, and then there's like a minus 1 here. All right, so wait, let me. Uh,
Okay. Does this make sense? Maybe I feel like I might have been a little too quick with the notation, so I'll, I'll write something over there. But um, all I want to say is, what we're actually going to do is we're not going to act, we're not going to solve this problem as you might imagine because we're trying to speed things up. What we're going to do is we're going to replace a by pi a, where pi is a subspace embedding, and then we're going to solve the new regression problem, pi a x minus pi b. That just requires us to compute the SVD of pi a, or compute pi a transpose pi a. But computing the SVD of pi a doesn't take you d squared time, or n d squared time, it takes you m d squared time, right? Because pi a is an m by d matrix. And if m is something like d, right, we said that you can achieve m being d, um, then m is d, so instead of n d squared, it's d d squared, which is d cubed. So it's faster. Of course, there's the issue of a, you need to actually apply pi, okay, and b, um, you need to actually find pi. If you find pi by computing an SVD, well, yes, you can solve the lower dimension problem faster, but you spent nd squared finding pi anyway, so what's the point? Okay, so that's so we're gonna look at um, we're gonna look at how to find such pi's faster. Let me rewrite that lemma because I feel like I uh, this introduction of D was maybe a little confusing, so. Yeah, it's, it's useful when the number of observations you have is a lot lar larger than the dimension. That's right. So we write that claim. So claim if pi is an epsilon subspace embedding for the span of the columns of A as well as B, so that's at most the d plus 1 dimensional subspace, because there are d plus 1 vectors here. Then for x tilde ls being the argmin of pi ax minus pi b squared, we have ax tilde ls minus b squared is at most 1 plus epsilon over 1 minus epsilon ax ls minus b. So if we, use, if we use this solution instead of the real optimal solution, we're not off by more than one, this 1 plus epsilon over 1 minus epsilon. OK? So let's prove that. So it's going to be something very simple. First of all, we know that, we know that this is true. This x tilde ls is the optimal solution for this regression problem. So in particular, it does better than XLS does for this regression problem, right? X tilde LS is the minimizer. But what is this vector? This vector is pi times AXLS minus B. And we said that pi preserves everything in the span of the columns of A as well as B. Well, this vector is in the span of the columns of A and B, so pi preserves it. So this is at most 1 plus epsilon AX LS minus B L2 norm squared. And you can do the same thing here. This is at least 1 minus epsilon AX tilde LS minus B L2 norm squared. And then you just move the 1 minus epsilon over there and you're done. Okay? So that's it. So total time to find uh, x tilde ls, it's time to find pi plus time to compute the things you need to compute, which are uh, pi a and pi b plus you know, O of m times d squared to then solve the lower dimensional regression problem. 
So we're happy, you know, using that pi, we're very happy with the third bullet because m is as small as it could be, m is d. We're not as happy with, uh, well, okay, we're definitely not happy with the first bullet. Are we happy with the second bullet? I don't think we're happy with the second bullet either, actually, because to compute u transpose times a, well, um, u transpose a, you're multiplying a d by n dense matrix by an n by d matrix. And that can also take you nd squared time. So kind of we're not really happy with either of the first two bullets, but we're happy with the third. OK, so the rest of the lecture is going to be how to be happy with all bullets. Okay. And then at the end, if we have time, I'll tell you about <coughs> another. So this, this says, this, you know, there's a claim here. You should think of, it, you should think of the, this as saying epsilon subspace embedding implies approximate regression. Or epsilon subspace embedding implies 1 plus epsilon approximate regression. Okay. We're going to have other theorems that say things like um, a 1 third subspace embedding together with some other steps implies 1 plus epsilon approximate regression. Okay, so um, there are some other steps there. But it's, it's going to have some advantages in terms of runtime. Because as you might imagine, quickly computing an epsilon subspace embedding is going to, the runtime is going to depend on epsilon. Okay? It's going to grow if epsilon is small. Um, and then we're also going to have another, another reduction which says, actually, you don't even need an epsilon. You don't need a, another thing you could do is uh, use like a one third subspace embedding combined with some other steps, some other different steps. And that also works. Okay? So we'll see that later. But now let me actually tell you how to come up with subspace embeddings. So getting subspace embeddings two methods Just like last time, sampling is one method, and the other method is going to be uh, kind of a JL method. So let's start off with sampling. So when I say sampling, I'm going to look at the case where pi is actually an n by n matrix. But uh, the diagonals are going to be either 1 or 0. Okay, And we're going to have to normalize. So eta, I, eta 1 over p1, eta 2 over p2, eta n over pn. I'll say something about this in a second, where eta i is equal to 1 if we sample row i of a, which we'll call little a i, and 0 otherwise. And the expectation of a to i is equal to p i. So remember that A transpose A is equal to the sum k goes from 1 to n of AK, AK transpose. Right? Where I'm thinking of AK as actually being a column vector. Okay? So the ith row of A is actually AI transpose. Okay. So then pi A transpose pi a, actually, I think to be te technically to be correct, I should put a square root here on the p on the pi's. Okay. Um, so pi a transpose pi a, well, the, the kth row of pi a is, is a k times eta k over root pk, right? 
the kth row is ak if we actually sampled the kth row. Otherwise, it's 0. And we normalize it by root pk. So if you take ak, ak transpose, what you get is the sum k goes from 1 to n of eta k over pk. So I put a square root here just because since you're kind of taking ak, ak transpose, when you multiply the square roots, you get back pk times ak, ak transpose. Okay. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to keep each row independently with some, pro with some probability pk. pk is going to depend on k. Okay, so it's going to be non-uniform sampling. Just like last lecture, we kept a row with probability proportional to its L2 length. Right? Now we're going to keep a row with proportional to some other probability. We're going to have to figure out what that is. Okay, but it's going to be non-uniform independent row sampling. Another thing you could imagine doing is rather than, so here kind of you have an expected number of rows, which is the sum of the PIs. Right? The number of rows you get from this matrix is not deterministic. It's a random number of rows that you get. Another thing you could do is just sample m rows independently from the same distribution according to the PIs. That also works. It's just on the board it's a little easier for me to, to show this one. Okay. So you know, before I tell you what these sampling probabilities are, it's going to look a little weird if I tell you out of nowhere. I want to tell you why the sampling probabilities that I'm going to tell you are like the most natural thing to do. Okay. Actually, this uh, I should think. So Michael Cohen uh, gave me this uh, way of saying it, which I think is really the maybe the right way to say it, uh, so it makes so it makes some intuitive sense. So. <clears throat> um, good. So, first of all. I don't want, so why did I do it this way? Notice that, first of all, notice that the expectation of pi a transpose pi a is equal to the sum over k of the expectation of eta k over pk, a k, a k transpose, which is just a transpose a, right? The expectation of eta k is pk. So the reason I divided by pk is exactly so that I get an unbiased estimator of a transpose a. Now, how should I set the pks? I don't want any pk. So now this is more intuition now. Okay, so let me write this. How should we set the pks? So I don't want any pk to be 0, because if it's 0, then we're just missing a row, and we're not even getting the right expectation. Okay. So given that none of these pks are 0, okay, um, define what I'll call ri as being the soup over x in R, uh, rd. of ai transpose x squared over the norm ax squared. Some, some number I just made up. Okay, but let's define ri to be this. Okay. I claim that if we don't set pk to be at least rk, then you know, we're in trouble. Or we're not in trouble, but uh, if we don't set, then um, let's say it doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to sample, intuitive sense, to sample, uh, to sample with less probability than rk. And why is that? So if, if we're buying the argument that if we're buying the argument that we should sample the row at all, that pk should be non-zero, okay? Well, <clears throat> let's look at the event 
that we actually did sample rho k. Okay? Look at event that we did sample rho k, then c, well, pi a transpose pi a, we call it rho i, is equal to 1 over pi a i a i transpose plus the sum over all the other k's not equal to i of eta k over p k a k a k transpose. Okay. Now, <clears throat> pick the x which achieves the soup in the definition of Ri. Right? That implies that x transpose pi a transpose pi a x, which is just the same thing as pi a x L2 norm squared, is equal to, well, a i transpose x squared over p i plus a sum of stuff which is all not negative, right? So this is at least a i transpose x squared over p i, right? But we chose x to achieve this soup. So we know that ai transpose x squared is equal to the L2 norm squared of ax times ri. So this is equal to the L2 norm squared of ax times ri over pi. Right? So maybe I should have said, um, you know, if we don't set it to be at least uh, so what do we want? Kind of what we see is this thing is at least this. So if pi is too small, if pi is less than, let's say, rk over 2, this is bigger than 2ax squared if pi is less than ri over 2. Right? Does that make sense? So if we're sampling at a rate that's much less than ri, like less than ri over 2, then whenever we actually do sample that row, we're guaranteed to be screwed. OK? Because there is this x that's making it too big. So if we're going to sample the row, why are we sampling at a rate that's guaranteeing us to be screwed when it's actually sampled? That doesn't seem to make intuitive sense. So the, the intuition is that kind of the sampling probability should be something like these ris. And actually, that's exactly what, roughly what they're going to be doing. OK, so now let me, let me give a definition. Definition, given A, the ith, given A, the ith leverage score Li is Li, which is equal to Ai transpose A transpose A inverse Ai. I'm assuming again that A has full column rank. If it doesn't have full column rank, then this is pseudo inverse, where you write the SVD of A transpose A, and then that's equal to U sigma V transpose, and then you take V sigma inverse U transpose. Okay, so now claim 
li is equal to ri. Okay. So really, the thing that we should be doing is we should be sampling by these leverage scores. Okay. So let's prove this claim. <coughs> and the observation is, note that both ri and li are basis independent. What do I mean by that? I.e., if um, M is a square invertible matrix, then Li of A is the same thing as Li of AM, and Ri of A is the same thing as Ri of AM. Okay. So let me convince you of that. Let's look at the definition of Ri. Okay. So Ri of AM is equal to the soup over x of, um, now I guess we would have AI transpose MX, I guess. <clears throat> But then we can just view this as just view this as y, right? Any y can be written as mx, right? Because what what should well what should x be? X is just m inverse y. M is invertible. So this is the same thing as soup over y of a i transpose y squared over a y squared which is the same thing as ri of a. Okay. So <laughs> good. So we can assume that that um, so we can choose we can choose m So choose M such that A tilde being AM has orthonormal columns. So M would be, for example, uh, V sigma inverse from the SVD. Okay. So, so like without loss of generality, we can just assume this A is actually this A tilde, which is AM. And then we have that Ri is equal to soup over X AI transpose X squared over, well, the L2 norm squared of X, of AX squared is just the norm of X squared now. Okay. And then we have Li is equal to AI transpose A transpose A inverse um, AI. But this is just the identity now. So this is equal to AI L2 norm squared. So the question is, which x achieves the soup here? The x that achieves the soup is the vector AI itself, or yeah, the vector AI itself. OK. So this thing is actually the same thing as just AI L2 squared. So these two things are the same. OK. <clears throat> So you might be wondering something right now, uh, which is great. So we sample by leverage scores. How do you compute the leverage scores? OK, so so if you just kind of re 
think th through a little of what I said here. What I said was, we'll choose m such that a has, a, a m has orthonormal columns. So what is m? m is v sigma inverse. So this is really saying that a m is u from the SVD. And then what we're saying is, we're sampling according to these AI, L AI squareds after we made it have orthonormal columns. So this thing is actually just ui squared, right? We're sampling according to the, row, the squared row norms of u, where u is a matrix that has orthonormal columns forming a basis for the column space of A. How do we get u? The SVD. So, <laughs> so um, great. We can compute the leverage scores and sample according to leverage scores. But to get the leverage scores, we need the SVD. So we're back to uh, nowhere, basically. Um, but as you will probably see on the P set, I think I'll make this a P set problem, there is a way to approximate the leverage scores. So it's OK if you don't exactly sample according to leverage scores. If you sample up to like, uh, an approximation of them, that's going to be good enough. OK? Um, so you'll see that on the PSAT. And you can get an approximation. You can get an approximation of the leverage scores actually using the JL approach that we're going to see after this. Okay. So to, inst to actually instantiate the sampling approach, you really need to go through the JL approach as far as, well, there are some other papers actually that do it in a different way, like um, uh, this iterative row sampling by uh, Lee, Miller, and Pang. And there have been subsequent works as well. Um, but good. So, <clears throat> and so, so this is now the theorem. This theorem is due to, let me make sure I, oh, actually, before I write the theorem down, so we said that we're sampling according to leverage scores, right? So how many samples do we actually need? So if we sample, by the way, I haven't, just remember, I haven't yet proven that sampling by leverage scores works. I just said, you know, if you follow this intuition, then you should be sampling by at least the leverage scores. Um, so you should be sampling by something that's at least this. Yeah. 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 It is square because, oh wait, is it not square? Sorry? Um, M is equal to, so sigma is r by r, where r is the rank. V is equal to n by r. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Um, Right. So, oh yeah, pad. You're saying pad sigma with. Um, so a is n by d. We do a d by d rotation. Sorry. Maybe that. Well, I, I wanted to say that. <coughs> I want to say that any, I can replace this mx by y, and then x is just m inverse y. So taking the soup over x here is the same as taking the soup over y there. Um, yeah, maybe I confused myself for a second. Uh, let me just, yeah, yeah? Let me just fix, oh, okay. Should maybe the soup not necessarily over all x, but over all x, and like the, the don't get killed by a, and then if it's an x that doesn't get killed by a, then Oh, you mean, so for any x that's not in the kernel? Yeah, like you could probably fix things that way. Um, yeah, let me let me not think about this as I'm standing here because I'll probably I'm not seeing it right immediately. I'm sure there's some simple thing that I'm just missing. I'll just fix that in the notes. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, good. So, uh, if we sample, if we were to sample according to u i squared. Then expected number of rows sampled is equal to, well, it's the sum over i of pi. 
which is equal to the sum over i u i squared, which is equal to the Frobenius norm squared of u. Let's say a, a is an n by d matrix. It has rank d. So what's the Frobenius norm squared of u? It's d. Because you can, one way to view the Frobenius norm squared is the sum of all the squared row norms. But it's also the same as the sum of all the squared column norms. And each column has, has norm 1, because it's an orthonormal basis. So you, this is d. So you expect to sample d rows. Okay. So now let me write the theorem. Uh, this theorem is due to uh, Drenaeus, Mahoney, and Mutu Krishnan. This is soda 06. If um, if we choose pi to be at least up to a constant, let's say the ma the min of one. Of course, you can't sample something with probability bigger than one. And um, let's say log d over delta times ui l2 norm squared over epsilon squared. Then the probability that pi is not an epsilon subspace embedding for A is at most delta. Okay? So the rows that have a large enough leverage score, like sometimes this expression can be bigger than one. By the way, how big, how big can a leverage score get? Yeah, so note that ui l2 norm squared is the same thing as uu transpose ei l2 norm squared, which is the projection onto the, subspa onto the subspace span by you know, a of ei l2 norm squared. OK, so this right here is just uh, EI transpose, UU transpose, UU transpose EI, and U transpose U is the identity. Okay. Um, so this thing is just the same. So yeah, so this is, this is, uh, this and this are the same thing. Um, and we, and projection operators don't blow up norms. They can only shrink norms. So this is at most the norm squared of EI which is 1. So none of the leverage scores can ever be bigger than 1. And they sum up to d. Okay, so since you're sampling by the leverage score times something bigger than 1, this could potentially blow up to be bigger than 1. But then if it ever becomes bigger than 1, you just deterministically sample it. Otherwise, you sample according to this probability. Um, <coughs> Let me see how much I want to say here. So I'll uh, let me state a tool and then show you how this can go. So you can analyze, or you can prove that theorem using. For example, matrix turnoff bounds. Or you've seen Kinchin, you can also use, or non commutative Kinchin. Maybe I'll just show you what this looks like, because it's something similar to things you've seen. So, definition Shat and P norm. of A for 1 less than equal to P less than equal to infinity is A Shatton P norm is the LP norm 
of the singular values of A. Okay, so take the SVD of A, take those singular values in sigma, and take their LP norm. That's the Shatten P norm. And if A has rank at most D, note um, ASP is equal to theta of uh, the operator norm, which is equal to Shatten infinity for P being at least log D. This is by Holder's inequality. So Shatten log D norms, or Shatten P norms for P at least log D, are basically the same as operator norm. And then there's a theorem. This is due to Lust, Picard, and PZA in 91. This is the non-commutative Kinchin inequality, which says that <coughs> Uh, if you look at the expectation of um, sum over i, sigma i, a i, shat and p norm to the p to the 1 over p. So this is something like LP norm for scalars, but now for matrices. This is, and these are Rademachers. So these sigma i's are plus minus 1. And this is expectation over sigma. This is at most up to a constant root p times the max of two terms. The first term is uh, sum over i sigma i uh, uh, ai transpose ai chat and p norm p over two norm to one half and sum over i, ai, ai transpose, shat and p over 2 norm to the 1 half. OK? And I'm not going to, maybe I'll also turn this into a homework problem. I need to figure that out. Or I'll just put in the notes. Um, you can use this. Remember, you remember there was this idea of symmetrization and then using, and then using Kinchin and then doing the square root trick. We've done, we've seen things like that before. Um, you can do that kind of thing, and basically prove this theorem using using this inequality. And you'll 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 choose p to be big enough. Like you'll choose p to be so. Um, choose p to be something like log of d over delta, and then you'll apply, the non, you'll apply this non-commutative kitchen. The d appears because you want to basically say that Shatten p norm and operator norm are the same thing. Okay. Okay. So, a question? Yeah. So one is one is AI transpose AI, and the other is AI AI transpose. So if, you know, in our case, the summands are actually symmetric matrices. So they're the same thing. So you don't need this max. But in general, if you have non-symmetric AIs, you need to do that. OK, so that's, that's all I want to say about the sampling approach. So, um, yeah, that's all I want to say about the sampling approach. So in total, the number of samples you'll need will be d times log d over delta over epsilon squared, right? At most that. I should mention, note, wanting. Uh, Pi AX L2 norm squared is equal to AX L2 norm squared up to this 1 plus minus epsilon for all X. 
is the same as what is what is a? A is u sigma v transpose. Pi u sigma v transpose y L2 norm squared is equal to u sigma v transpose y up to 1 plus or minus epsilon for all y. So let me just call this x. So what we actually want, we want that for all x, pi u L2 norm squared is equal to 1 plus or minus epsilon ux, or x L2 norm squared. Actually, I should say ux. But ux is the same norm as x. So this is the same thing as 1 plus or minus epsilon x squared. Thus, what we want is uh, that the soup over x of unit norm of x transpose pi u transpose pi u minus the identity is less than epsilon. That's what we actually want, right? X, so x transpose times this is exactly, and with an x here, is exactly pi u x l2 norm squared. And then we have x transpose identity x. That's just x l2 norm squared. We want that to be at most epsilon times the square norm of x, which is 1. So what we actually want is that the operator norm of pi u transpose pi u minus the identity is less than epsilon. So saying that we want a subspace embedding for A, an epsilon subspace embedding for A is equivalent to saying that we want this. The operator norm of pi u transpose pi u minus identity is less than epsilon. OK? So good. now that I've said that, let me move into the JL way of looking at things. So we want that uh, pi u x L2. Well, we want this, right? The original definition of subspace embedding, which is equivalent to that. So notice here, by the way, that the columns of u are an orthonormal basis for E. E is that subspace that we've always been talking about, like the column space of A. And u, is just an or, u just has an orthonormal basis for E as its columns. Okay, so saying that your subspace embedding for E, an epsilon subspace embedding for E, is the same thing as saying this. Okay, so we want that pi x L2 norm squared is equal to 1 plus or minus epsilon L2 norm squared for all x, which is in this, which for all x which is in E, i.e., the soup over x in E intersect the sphere. So all vectors in E of unit norm of pi x squared minus 1 should be less than epsilon. So where have you seen something like this expression? Right, this, was, this was what we were dealing with when we were talking about Gordon's theorem. Right, so this, this could be an example t from Gordon's theorem. Remember, so Gordon, what Gordon told us was if pi ij is you know, a random sign over root m, then suffices to have m being at least the Gaussian mean width squared of the set t plus 1 over epsilon squared. Right? So now the question is just, if we take a random sign matrix, how many rows do we need? Well, 
Well, what's g squared of that set? So g of e intersect Sn minus 1 is equal to <coughs> uh, the expectation over g, the soup over x of unit norm. Let's say x, uh, x as unit norm, g dot ux. Right? The set of all vectors in, in the subspace of unit norm can be written as ux, where x is unit norm. And this right here is, right, it's equal to g transpose ux. This is the same thing as saying the expectation over g of the soup over x of unit norm of u transpose g dot x. Okay. So here's a property of Gaussians. They're spherically symmetric. Okay. So if you take a Gaussian and then apply some rotation to the Gaussian, you just get back, if you take a vector of independent Gaussians, okay, they're all mean 0 and variance 1, and you apply any rotation to them, you get back another set of Gaussians of mean 0 and variance 1. So what does it mean to apply u transpose to this Gaussian? Basically, I'm doing a rotation and then only keeping the first d coordinates. So here's a Gaussian in Rn. But u, u, t, g, u, u transpose g is just a Gaussian in Rd. This is the expectation uh, over g in Rd now. If you want to call it g prime in Rd. Soup over x of unit norm of g dot x. g prime dot x. And this, this is just equal to the L2 norm of g prime. So this is at most the expectation of the L2 norm squared of g prime to the 1 half, right? which is uh, the sum over i g prime expectation g prime i squared square root, which is equal to root d. So what we just showed is g of this thing is at most root d. So for us, this thing is just d over epsilon squared. Right? g squared is then d. So what this tells us is if we take a random sign matrix or a random Gaussian matrix, you know, it'll, <coughs> by Gordon's theorem, it'll preserve a d-dimensional subspace as long as it has d over epsilon squared rows. There are other ways to prove this without using Gordon's theorem, just using a net argument. Um, but, you know, that's great. <clears throat> great. Um, so what's, okay, so th this is pretty good, right? Because before we had these three bullets, or what we want from our pies. The third bullet was pi should have few rows because our regression was faster. The first bullet is we should find pi quickly. The second bullet is we should multiply pi a quickly. So this, you know, m is great. It's d over epsilon squared. That's the third bullet. The first bullet, can we find pi quickly? Yeah, we don't even need to look at a. Okay, it's just a random matrix. The second bullet is a problem. Trouble. Pi a takes time. You know, basically O, M, and D using for loops, which is actually even bigger than n d squared. <laughs> right? Actually, multiplying pi a is more expensive than solving the original regression problem. So we want to use a fast pi. Think, for example, sparse JL or fast JL, something like that. And we're going to see it's possible. Um, 
this is possible. So this is uh, kind of this is this was introduced by Sar so this idea of using this JL approach was introduced by Sarloche. And maybe I should give a definition. Definition. An epsilon delta d oblivious uh, subspace embedding. So it's usually called OSE. Is a distribution d over m by m matrices such that for all u in n by d <laughs> with orthonormal columns, the probability over pi drawn according to d of this operator norm pi u transpose pi u minus the identity is bigger than epsilon is at most delta. Does that make sense? So this condition is saying that pi failed to be a subspace embedding for the common space of u. So pi, so pi is drawn from an oblivious subspace embedding distribution. If, if you draw a random pi from that distribution, the probability that you fail to be a subspace embedding is at most delta. This distribution doesn't depend on u. So it doesn't depend on a. Okay. Um, so for example, a random Gaussian matrix or random sign matrix, et cetera. And Charlo showed, showed that Okay, one way to get it, yeah, yes, it's true. One way to get an oblivious subspace embedding is to take a Gaussian matrix. But Charlo said, actually, you can take um, you know, some fast JL matrix, and then you can get speed up. Okay, so next time, at the beginning of next lecture, I'll say a little bit more about oblivious subspace embeddings. Okay, um, and then I'll, I'll also show you those other two ways of using subspace embeddings for regression, besides the one I just showed you. And then we'll see ap other applications like PCA, for example. Okay, so. Uh, do you have P sets for that? Yeah, or? OK, so the problem sets are in the back. Problem set three, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And don't forget that uh, your project proposals are due, what is it, two, in two days, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. <laughs>